Hey everyone, welcome to the next lesson. I believe this is number four, but I could lose track. But it starts to get into the stuff that is really interesting to me. So I like this one and the next one, which is going to be on what goes on in the body. Um, the mind and body are both very important and significant in managing trauma. We have shifted a little bit to focus more on the body over the last decade or so compared to before, and it's been a good thing. It's really expanded our ability to help people deal with trauma more. So this will be specifically about the threat response system in the mind, and then next we will get into the body and their connection. So impact of stress on operation of the brain. So we're just gonna look at stress in general, not specifically trauma, anxiety, etc. cetera. Um, although, you know, anxiety is a form of stress. It's stress in the mind, stress in the body. Some people like to think of stress as one thing and anxiety differently. It's semantics, so you can kind of decide on your own. First off, the brain is flooded with stress hormones when we are activated into that fight or flight mode. We have adrenaline released into our body, which is why we experience the shakiness when we feel angry, anxious, or scared. Cortisol, which is, um, it's used for a couple different things, but one thing that it can help with is management of pain. If you are in a situation where that might be occurring, maybe you're, you know, if you're battling that lion, or the lion attacks you, the pain is not as overbearing so that you can continue to try and survive. And um, norepinephrine, and there's some others in there too. We'll get into more of those later. So the parasympathetic nervous system, which is PNS, is essentially the break. That is the side of the nervous system that's responsible for calming us after we've been activated. Most specifically is something called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is connected from your brain to your throat, in your ear, your throat, pharynx, larynx, down to your heart, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and a bunch of other things. We are gonna get into that one later specifically because that's a very significant nervous system um, concept. And there's ways to stimulate and heal and improve the ability of the vagus nerve to operate, which means it improves your ability to regulate anxiety. The brain becomes hypersensitive to threat when you are exposed to trauma and other stressors on a regular basis. The amygdala, which is the little part of the brain that's located in the middle area, which is referred to as the mammalian brain um, by many, and we'll get into that. It is responsible for basically taking all incoming information and determining is this threatening or not threatening. And then if it says threatening, then it triggers all the body response, which uh, we, we're gonna go in detail in the next segment as well. The amygdala is taught to be overreactive if it is exposed to similar threats on a regular basis. So for example, you're walking down the street, you have a buddy and a car backfires. You turn quickly with curiosity, like what is that? and your friend you know, takes off running at full speed. Well, your friend may have been, um, maybe he's a veteran or maybe he lived in a neighborhood where there was a lot of violence and you know, gun violence was common. And so his amygdala is hypersensitive to loud, abrupt noises because they mimic gunfire or whatever it is that he was exposed to. So his amygdala is taught to be more afraid of loud, uh, spontaneous noises or abrupt noises than you are. Um, the amygdala can actually become larger inside the brain. Like, just like if you do bicep curls every day, your biceps hopefully get bigger. The amygdala gets bigger as it practices being over responsive. The ability to make rational decisions is halted or dampened or unavailable. The frontal lobe is unable to adequately challenge the emotional response that occurs in the middle part of the brain with the amygdala, the limbic system, and other areas. Normally, you have an emotional reaction based off of a perception, a belief, and then the frontal lobe comes in and applies logic, experience from past ex you know, experiences and stuff like that to do this overall comprehensive evaluation of is this moment threatening or not. When you are in the trauma response, that frontal lobe middle brain connection is basically disconnected or damaged. So you're not getting the logic, you're getting the impulsive emotion. The logic centers are overpowered, 
and this is what leads to irrational thoughts and behaviors, well, what appear as irrational, but in the brain, they think that they're rational because they're survival. They're trying to escape the lion in front of it that you perceive. Our brains are trained to notice the negative. So it's not just like a bunch of people walking around and they're all grumpy because they just decided to be grumpy. Our brains learn to hold on to negative Im imagery, memories, information, because negative experiences mean threatening experiences to our brain. And threat is important. The first time we went to Disneyland and it was amazing to our brain, that's not important. We don't need to know how amazing Disneyland was in order to survive the next situation that may be threatening. We need to remember how that guy mugged us and took our wallet when we were in the grocery store. And now we need to know that grocery scores, stores are scary. There's a trouble in the connection between our brains as, in, as a mammal, as an animal, and our brains as a social human. We have evolved very quickly. We live on top of one another now. In 30-story buildings, you walk by 200 people or more a day that could possibly kill you, for all you know, because you don't know them. There's trains, there's planes, there's cars made of metal, there's people with guns, there's police officers, there's dogs off their leashes, there's people using drugs that make them act irrational. There's so many threats around us. Our brain was not wired to understand all of those threats. As we socially evolved, we have, gone, we have rapidly evolved socially, if you really look at the timeline, compared to just our animalistic human evolution. So negative experiences are highlighted, but now there's a lot more possible threats and negative experiences due to our social interaction around the globe rather than in tiny tribes at most. So we have a lot of reason to be scared of a lot of things. We're also exposed to a lot of things like media. So, we, so if you go into a parking garage and it's nighttime, well, some people would feel scared if they went into an underground parking garage, their car's there, there's maybe a car two down, two down, because we've learned that that's scary because we've seen it in movies, we've seen it on the news, whatever. Nothing's ever happened to us in that situation. There's no reason for us to be afraid of that scenario, except for we know that the threat exists. We know about crazy jumping spiders in Africa. We know about scorpions in the desert. We know about all these other animals. It, it, there's all these threats around the world that didn't used to be aware to our brain. Therefore, we didn't have fear of them. But now we do because we see that they are scary and they are threatening to other people. So negative experiences are highlighted and held in the brain because the brain believes these will help us survive in the future. The hippocampus, which is basically responsible for memory, it, it can shrink and become not accessible, basically. It's inhibited during times of high stress. It is actually responsible for helping in the threat response system in different ways. So it's not doing its normal job of taking in sensory information and kind of downloading into long-term memory which is a process that's much more complicated than that, but the hippocampus plays a key part in that. But it has a different role when our brain goes to quote unquote battle stations during the fight or flight response. So neurological drives and anxiety and trauma, what's going on in the brain? We're gonna look at it as the triune system. So triune is three, we got the frontal lobe, which is the human brain, AKA human brain, the middle part, which is the AKA mammal brain, and the back part, which is the AKA amphibian or hind brain. The front is the neocortex officially. The frontal lobe is overpowered when the middle mammalian brain is active in anxiety or fear response. The limbic system is located in the middle mammalian brain. That's the emotions. The amphibian brain is at the back, that's the core. This is the first part of the brain that ever developed and every creature on this earth has an, a brainstem, a, a hind brain. This is what keeps your heart pumping, your lungs moving, your blood flowing, all those things that you don't have choice over because frankly, I don't think any of us wanna to have to worry about remembering to breathe or moving our blood or pumping our lungs. Also located in this area is just the basic survival instinct, which is often referred to as a freeze or hypofreeze response, and we'll get to that later. So this is important to know. This is a simplified version, but no one brain region drives anxiety on its own. Instead, interactions among many parts of the brain in all different areas 
are very important altogether in how we experience anxiety. So it doesn't come from one region, it comes from all over the brain. We will simplify things because we want to understand the, the general, under, you know, get a general sense of what's going on. So there are regions in the frontal lobe that enhance the signals from the amygdala, and there's parts of the frontal lobe that can dampen signals from the amygdala. So information coming from the middle mammalian brain coming from the limbic system specifically in the mammalian brain. That's our emotional response system. That's the amygdala and other parts. It, emotional information coming from the middle part of the brain is normally monitored by the frontal lobe and then the frontal lobe uses logic to determine, yes, this is a threat and it enhances the response or it says, no, this is not a threat and it dampens the response. Logic balances emotion but not when you're in the trauma response, okay? Now we're gonna focus specific areas. Brainstem, the amphibian brain. The medulla oblongata is located here. It's the control center for your heart, lungs, those, those basic functions I mentioned to you before that we don't have control over. Motor and sensory signals between the spine and the brain happen here. So this is where you could, I guess, say there's that scientific or tangible um, connection of mind-body. Automatic functions like breathing and swallowing. The pons is located here and that controls sleep and arousal times. That helps with our bio clock and stuff like that. Balance and equilibrium is also located here. And as most people or many people know, that's also related to parts of your ear, right? The midbrain, the mammalian brain. This is where we have our temporal lobes. So this is the limbic system. These input, they take, they take sensory input and they help to sort through it, send it to the right regions of the brain so it can get utilized and processed and filed, etc. We also develop memory in this area of the brain and our language and speech production is mainly in this part of the brain as well. The amygdala is in this part and that is the piece that is only focused on incoming information and determining threat or no threat, that's it. The amygdala then communicates to the hypothalamus and that relays the signal through all your neurons and through your brain to set off hormones and different um, chemicals that are part of the stress response, like cortisol, norepinephrine, and um, adrenaline. The hippocampus, which is located here, is the part that's mainly for memory. That's the part that gets um, redirected to other functions during fight or flight response, so it's not taking in the information and correctly directing it to memory stores where they need to go. Front part of the brain. This is the human brain. This is the last part of the brain to develop. We have the most advanced frontal lobe, which is why we are basically the most advanced animals that we know of. Other animals have a frontal lobe. Sharks have one, monkeys have one, but it's not nearly as developed as ours. The frontal lobe is our muscle control, movement. Part of our memory also happens here our main thinking and decision-making and logic and planning. It's also our foresight. So it's our ability to see two roads. One's on fire, one's full of money, and we can make the decision that the one full of money is probably going to end up turning out better for us if we walk down it as opposed to the one on fire. If we didn't have our frontal lobe, essentially we'd be taking a 50-50 shot at that, as crazy as it sounds. The parietal lobes are here, and these are, these are important for processing sensory information incoming from the outside world. See, hear, touch, taste, smell. Um, so som somatosensory, right? Soma is body. Um, this is essential for processing the touch sensation. Haptic feedback might be something you have heard before. Um, so it allows our brain to take the signals, which they're just signals. They're, they're waves, sine waves, basically looking things, signals, and decipher them into what that means inside of our brain. The occipital lobes are here. These are for processing visual information coming through your retina. And um, there is a hierarchy to these systems. We're not gonna go into those right now, but the, you know, the, the things in this part of the brain, they split and go to other areas of the brain. There's a whole direction system set up in your brain that is meant to com communicate the front to the back, the middle to the front, the front to the middle, et cetera. These are the references for today. I only put the one because that was the statement that I used. There's obviously other references for this stuff. There's going to be a accumulation of references at the end. 
but that is essentially what is occurring in the brain. The brain is perceiving, is taking incoming sensory information. It is filtering through the amygdala and other parts of the brain and deciding is this a threat or not a threat using some of the logic from the frontal lobe. If it's not a threat, then the information is then processed and stored into the memory and any unimportant details and information is just discarded. If it is a threat, the amygdala takes over, triggers a hormonal response to release various different chemicals that go down into the body, trigger the body, which we will be discussing next. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or just want to yell at me, please contact me at my webpage, www.theanxiousmammal.com. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that I can, and if I don't know the answer, I will either find it or I will direct you to an appropriate resource. Thank you.